Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who hears all things that are taking place. You hear the cries of our heart for loved ones who, Lord, who are in physical pain, for family members and for neighbors. Lord, that we see things take place and we know that there is nothing that we can do to help. So we lift up our voice to you and we ask that you would intervene in their life. It is difficult for us to see people suffering or hurt in any way. And we ask, Lord, that you would divinely intervene and fix the situation. We think of neighbors uh, who are fighting, who are lost without you and are looking for some way to resolve and fix things, but the only way that things can move forward is if they come to know Christ as their Savior. Lord, we pray for our family members that don't know Christ, and for the mailman, and for the people to do the checkout of our groceries. Lord, we ask that you would use us, maybe use someone else, that might share the good news, that might encourage them to uh, hear about Christ, Sometimes, Lord, we're in a loss of just how can we be used. So we pray for those people and ask that you would send a, a spirit of revelation, a spirit of wisdom upon them that they might see things from a perspective that they've never seen before, that they might understand the truth and the darknesses upon so many people's hearts and lives today, Lord, that that would be lifted so they might see the truth and be liberated and be freed. Lord, we think of our own needs and our need for a stronger relationship with you. Lord, I'm sure the things that Jonathan said was like a prick in many of our hearts, thinking all the things that we've done, and it, if it only counts up for our entire time of 70 years of five months, wow. And yet you want to spend an all eternity with us? How incredible you are that you want to spend all eternity with people who give so little time back to you. Lord, as we've lifted up your great name with these songs, may the reading of your word be blessed and may the preaching of your word convict our hearts and cause us to move closer to you in our walk, in the way that we talk, and in our deeds. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, scripture reading today is verse 21 through 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh and he of the free women through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. 
Lord, we just ask you to give us some insight into your word. Help us to understand your truth. That we might walk away knowing you better. And that would cause us to live as sons and daughters of God. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been told that we cannot teach the Bible to the younger generation because it assumes a basic knowledge of the people, the places, and the culture that this generation does just, that just does not have any longer. But another reason the Bible cannot be taught to this generation is because of the technical use of language. But how can we boast of this generation's educational accomplishments and at the same time claim that the Bible is just too difficult for them to understand. The Apostle Paul had no concerns conclaiming and proclaiming the gospel to a pagan culture and teaching about Jewish people, teaching about Jewish places, or even Jewish cultures with those who have no background of any of these things. Perhaps that's because the Word of God The truth from God's Word is conveyed by people. The truth of God's Word is conveyed over places and through cultures. And this is how the message of Galatians can be so relevant to us today, especially to religious people. Paul sharply asks this group of people in verse 21, he says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law... Do you hear the law? John Stott writes about this passage, and I think it's worth reading. He says, and I quote, There are many like this today. They are not, of course, the Jews or Judaizers to whom Paul was writing, but people whose, religious, whose religion is legalistic, who imagine that the way to God is by the observant of certain rules. They are even professing Christians who turn the gospel into law. They suppose that their relations to God depends on a strict adherence to regulations, traditions, and ceremonies. They are in bondage to them, unquote. The Apostle Paul has been making the point throughout this letter that Christianity is unique. It is the result of the supernatural work of God. In the first two chapters, Paul is defending the gospel. And that's why he writes right off the bat, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who has called you by the grace of Christ to another gospel. What in the world has happened to these believers? And then in chapters 3 and 4, we have the explanation of the gospel. And yet... Here's another striking thing. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed? Is it possible that somehow they misunderstood the grace of God? Did they not understand the Abrahamic covenant? Abraham received the promise of the Spirit through faith. Man is justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. So chapter 4 concludes with, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? Do you know the implications of the law? And we should consider just for a moment the contrast between law and And the promise, or between law and grace. Because the law prohibits me, but grace invites me and gives to me. The law condemns me, but grace redeems me. The law says, do, but grace says, it is done. The law says, continue to be holy, but grace says, I am already holy. The law curses me, but grace blesses me. The law slays me, and grace saves me. The law shuts my mouth before God, 
Grace opens my mouth to praise. The law condemns the very best person. Grace saves the very worst person. The law demands a payment. And grace gives freely. The law reveals sin. There it is. Got it, got it. And points all the time. Grace atones for sin. The law was given by Moses. Grace was given by Christ. The law demands obedience. Grace enables obedience. The law was written on stone. Grace is written on the heart. The law is just temporary. And yet, grace is forever. The law placed me in bondage. Grace grants me liberty. The law makes me a slave, but grace makes me a son. That's the difference between the two. And it's important for us as believers in Jesus Christ to make sure that we understand the difference between these two great things. For the Apostle Paul sketches a picture of Abraham's two sons as a mean of clarifying the Galatian problem. So they can see, without a doubt, that they are free. So our outline today follows that simple outline that the Apostle Paul is looking at. In verses 21 to 31, he's saying, here's this picture for you to see. Abraham had two sons. This is the fact. And second, there's a spiritual truth that we need to grasp. There's two women here, and these two women represent different covenants. And third, there's the practical reality. Expect opposition. So those are our three outlines. Get the facts, see the spiritual truth, and expect opposition. So your first point is the facts. What are the facts that we see in verse 21 through 23? Paul again just says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and he who was of the free woman through the promise. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Turn with me to, to Genesis chapter 16. Perhaps it's been a while since you've been in the book of Genesis, or maybe you were just there yesterday reading through this. But I think it's important for us to go back and remember the things that took place in this book. As we read through some of the aspects that Abraham and Sarah were going through. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne no, born him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain a child by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, and the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Now you and I might look at this and say, what in the world and how in the world did they live in those days? But Sarai is basically saying to Abraham, after Abraham has received this promise from God, she says, look, we have been here 10 years, and I haven't had a child. I'm old. I'm an old woman. I'm not just an old woman. I am a very old woman. We both know that. And we need an heir. We're both getting up there in age. It's not like they just hit 65 and they're like, okay, we're at the retirement age. No, they both know their age and they're at the point where they're going, any day we could go and be with the Lord. So she's talking to Abraham and Abraham's talking to her and the idea comes up, let's have a child. But let's have a child through Hagar. 
So Sarah and Abraham, were they honest in what they were doing? Were they trying to sin? Do you ever think about the name that they gave Abram? Or excuse me, that they gave uh, Ish, they, the name of their first son, Ishmael? Have you thought about that name? They called his name Ishmael, and Ishmael means the Lord hears. This was their plan to assist God in answering the problem that they were having. We have no children. We need a child. God says we're going to have one. Maybe God is going to use the means of human, humans to help in his divine work. That makes sense after all. God was not directing this way, was he? We know that because we know the end of the story. But let's get a little narrower on this. Have you ever tried to help God solve one of your problems? The problem isn't that God didn't hear them, nor was God not directing in their life. The situation is just as simple as this. Faith does not manipulate. Faith does not scheme. Scheming is not faith. And yet, what do we see from Abraham all the way through his line, it seems like? They are constantly scheming and figuring out ways, how can we help God bring about his promises to us? It's like a family trait. It's infected all of us, too. But God doesn't need our help to bring about his promises. God will not be hindered, and God will not be hurried. God is slow from our perspective in all things. We pray for things, and we ask why God has not answered them in our timetable. But God has his own timetable that works in a perfect way. Now, their plan is found in Genesis 16. And Hagar is one of the mothers of the sons. So we have a son that's born to a different mother. Hagar's the first one. Sarah's the second. Go to Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 and 2. It says, Then the Lord appeared to him by the Tibber tree at Miram. And he was sitting there at the tent door in the heat of the day. And so he lifted his eyes and he looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground. Then he said to them, or then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? Oh, I'm going a little bit further. Skip down to verse 9 is where that picks up. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And so he said, here, in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Well, God's already said that he's going to give her a child. But it wasn't Ishmael. And now he's coming back and saying, I'm going to return to you the time of life. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind them. And now Abraham and Sarah were, were old, well advanced in years. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. Remember, he's like 10 years older than her. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I... Surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Now we're at chapter 18. We've got to go to chapter 21 real quick to see how all this comes about. In chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, And the Lord visited Sarah. As he said, 
And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore, bore Abraham his son in his old age at the set time for which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old. Wow. At just as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. So how old was Sarah? She's 10 years younger. Anybody here 90? You're a little bit older than 90? Can you imagine chasing around a newborn or a, six, a six-year-old child, I guess? Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> you would need God to return uh, the youth of life to you to, in order to chase them around. Yeah. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh and all who hear will laugh with me. Wow. So we have a mother that's born. We have two children, two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, born to different mothers, and they are born in different ways. Ishmael was born according to the flesh. Abraham and Sarah took matters into their own hands, and they had a child the natural way. There's nothing special or unique about how Abraham and Hera, or Hagar had a child. It's the natural means of having a child. And then Isaac... Isaac was supernaturally born. God had to intervene into the affairs of man and turn back the biological clock of Sarah. He restored to her the time of giving birth and opened her womb. So there's a lot going on with Sarah. This child being a child of promise is something for you to keep in mind his entire life. This is a golden child. This is a child that he is not about to be born and then die by accident. It is because through Isaac, the promise of God is going to be fulfilled. That's important to keep in mind when you think of the whole incident where Abraham takes him and binds him and the sacrifice thing is going to take place. So, back to this whole thing. We know Abraham had two sons from different women. These women represent two different covenants. And that's a spiritual truth that we need to be aware of today. So, go back to Galatians chapter 4. We've got the, our fill-ins. They are born to different mothers in different ways. And then our second thing, we're looking at spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth that we're looking at here today, in Galatians chapter 4, some people think this part of the book of Galatians is confusing because the Apostle Paul says things which are symbolic in verse 24 for these are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gave birth to bondage, which is Hagar. And for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now present and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem ab above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout. You who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now, Hagar had a husband temporarily. Abraham was just her temporary husband. So, when Paul says these things are symbolic or allegory, meaning what? As Paul, Paul is using a literary device to teach a spiritual truth. So when you hear the word allegory, do not think of a hidden meaning, but think of representation. The two women, Hagar and Sarah, represent two covenants. So you have the covenant of Mount Sinai, the first one, and then you have the covenant of promise, the second one. These are the two things that are taking place. Hagar, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai, the Mosaic Law, the earthly Jerusalem, those who are in bondage. When he says corresponds to, he means these are the ones that all line up to this. The law leads to bondage. But the covenant of promise, Sarah stands for the Abrahamic covenant. And the heavenly Jerusalem, those who are born free. 
Hagar is the bondwoman. Sarah is the free woman. Ishmael is naturally born. Isaac is supernaturally born. Hagar is part of the Old Testament. Sarah is part of the New Covenant. Hagar is, the, is connected with the earthly Jerusalem. Sarah is connected with the heavenly Jerusalem. Hagar is attached to, Drus- is, is attached to Judaism. Sarah is attached to Christianity. What's the spiritual truth that Paul is trying to get at here? Simply this. Christian, be free. Be free. Because there's a practical reality to all of this. And the practical reality that we see here in verse 28, he says, Now we, if your translation says, or says you, uh, you or we, Get the idea that the Apostle Paul is looking at us. Brethren, Christians there. Just as Isaac was, we are children of the promise. Are you a child of the promise? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are a child of the promise. He says, But as he who was born according to the flesh... Then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Even so it is now. So expect opposition. And Paul applies a very general opposition from the unsaved to the saved. And we see how Ishmael treated Isaac. Clear back in Genesis chapter 21 verse 9. It says, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. The idea of scoffing is mocking with the intent to cause harm. We see the same idea used over and over in the Old Testament. When Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law, who married his daughters, and he said, hey, let's get up out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. His sons-in-law thought, oh, he's just joking. He does, he's not really serious. No, no, this is serious stuff. The intent of his words are things are about, something bad is about to happen, so pay attention. Later on, when Potiphar's wife, in Genesis chapter 39, her accusation against the little Hebrew boy, I shouldn't say the young man, I should say because he was a young man, she says, see, Potiphar has brought in to us a Hebrew to mock us. It wasn't to tease us. It's to ridicule in such a, such a way. He came to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. In Exodus 32, verse 6, speaking of when Moses comes down from the mountain, he says, When they rose up early the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. That idea of play does not mean that they are out, the children of Israel are playing as Moses is coming down. It is an evil intent of things that are taking place. The point of this mocking that's taking place here, it's not like it's a comedy club that's happening. Bad things are associated with it. And of course you know when they mocked Jesus, they weren't about to release him. None of that is playful. It's serious serious, and it's harmful to those who are of the Spirit. Bigger opposition comes from those unbelieving but, but are associated in the religion. What do I mean by that? Just keep in mind that who was it that killed the prophets? It was the Jewish people. It wasn't Gentiles who were coming in and killing the prophets. It was the Jewish people. Who opposed Jesus? It was those who were part of the religion. The religion that Christ was speaking on against the law. They were against him. They were the ones that were agitating. And the same thing goes within Christianity. Oftentimes we find those who are in the church to be the biggest opposition because they are religious, but they are not walking by faith. So expect opposition to take place. That's just the practical reality of things that happen. In verse 30 and 31, it says, Nevertheless, what does Scripture say? Cast out the bond and her son, for the son 
of the bondwoman shall not inherit or shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Reject legalism. There is no, there's to be no compromise, no accommodation with legalism. Cast it out. We are to have no part with legalism. We are not to support any form of legalism. Or perhaps it's better to say legalism is to have no part with us. As Christians, we are no longer slaves, but we are free. But the challenge for many of us is if we don't have any type of legalism, if we don't have anything that's supposed to say, but you're supposed to do this, and this, and this, then how do we live the Christian life? Great. I'd like you to come back next week as we look at what our freedoms are all about in chapters 5 and 6. Because as Christians, it's important for us to understand what it means to be free. Because we don't have the Mosaic Law guiding us. We have the law of Christ guiding us. And his love constrains us. So today as we close and we come to this, we celebrate this idea that we are to be free from the law. And communion is a celebration of the freedom that we have in Christ. So when we come together today, we appreciate, we celebrate, we thank God that we are free because he has saved us from our sins. We are free from the penalty of sin. We are free from the guilt of sin. We are free from sin lording it over us and holding us. That gives us the freedom to walk faithfully before our God and to present him. So, as we have a moment, and I'm going to ask Cal to come up and help me with communion. Let me close in a word of prayer. And then I'm going to ask you to prepare your heart as we come to communion together. Lord, we thank you for the picture that we have here to remind us that we are free because of what Christ has done. Not because of any merit on our part. Because there is no freedom by our own strength. We did not liberate ourselves. We did, and nor could we help in that liberation. Lord, we stand before you because of the simple facts and the spiritual truth that's laid out before us that Christ has given us all that we have and that we did not earn or deserve. And we praise you for that. We come before you with a humble heart, recognizing that we are sinners and, un and an, unworthy, an unworthy people. And we thank you, Lord, for forgiving us of our sins. And providing a pathway for us to walk, which is following Christ. We find ourselves stumbling and failing in this quite often. But when we do stumble, Lord, you are there to tell us to get back up and keep, keep walking and keep coming forward towards you. It seems that Paul is constantly encouraging us and causing us and trying to stimulate our thinking and our walk to keep moving forward and not to be focusing on well, our failures all the time and not letting that trap us. We look forward to a time, Lord, where our bodies will be glorified and this life will be passed. But in the meantime, may we give more of our attention towards you. May our minds be more directed towards you. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.